age of seven, I'm two years on the streets, or more than that. Um, nine years in Longbourn Riverbank, institutionalised, seven birthdays in a row. Then all, all the time in, in and out of the prisons in WA, and then having turned my life around and going from um, dark to light, or from a bad life to a good life. When you live the life that I lived, and your whole life you just want to be a geek, a normal person, a productive member of society, um, one that can go on family holidays, go to one school, um, run up the corridor and jump into bed with mum and dad for cuddle, have one circle of friends and do all the normal stuff. My whole life, every time I got locked up, I just wish I was normal. I wish I had a decent mum. I wish I had a decent dad. Um, I wish I had just a normal family environment and do stuff that other kids, and I always hated that other people had what I always wanted. And I tried to get what they, what they had, but when I tried to hang around them, I felt like I was a weed, that I wasn't good enough and that they were better than me. And so I stuck hanging around people that I felt comfortable with. But the problem is people that I felt comfortable with, and they're all sticking picks around, smoking pipes, popping pills, breaking the houses, um, drinking all night, partying all weekend, doing 16 days no sleep, doing all lots of silly stuff. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be like the geeks. But it's not as easy as just saying, wake up one day and be a geek especially when you're 20, 30, 40 years old and you've been doing it uh, for me like 26 years. And so when I had an encounter with God and become a Christian in 2000, I had a full on encounter with God. I just got raided the day before by TRG. And I used to get that probably every six weeks. But I wake up one morning, I was doing two and a half kilos of meth and I had lots of guns and drugs and silly stuff and sleeping with prostitutes by my wife's back. And, and I got up one morning after 16 days no sleep, the helicopter over the roof. TRG, shotguns, bulletproof vests, come in my house front and back. And I got done with a pound of pot, a couple of handguns and some other stuff. And when I got out of, out of the bail or the lockup, me and my wife, my wife also got John in charge with handguns. And if you know Amanda, it's not her type of stuff. But anyway, I got out on bail and I just remember that I just chucked a prayer up. God, if you are real, I need your help. I mean, I've been around Australia running for myself seven times, but wherever I went, I went. I'd go to Kalgoorlie, start off with a packet, get to an eight ball, get to an ounce. And I knew what was coming, jail. So I run. I went to South Australia and done it again. I went to Gold Coast, done it again. I went to Carthage, done it again. I went around and around and around. And wherever I went, I went. Because of my personality, I attract people that I feel comfortable around. But the problem is the people that I feel comfortable around, they're all doing what I don't want to do. I can walk into a town and I can find the one drug dealer in the town. Um, and, and a lot of you are actually the same. And then I had this encounter with God at 2001, where all of a sudden I realised that he was real. Um, that these religious people that have been coming into Longmore and Riverbank and Hilston and Wansley and Clontarf and, and all these different children's homes and Casuarina and Cannyvale and Hakia and Carnet and Warroo and Bummery and all these Christian people that used to come in and tell me about God, that what the message they were, they were saying was actually true. I never believed it. I mean, I thought there was something up there, but I didn't have a clue what. But when I had an encounter with him, um, and when you, you have an encounter with him and you realise that he's actually true, it's like, wow, the light's going in your brain. Um, and one of the struggles that I had um, right at the beginning was trying to understand God. And as a new Christian, trying to understand God um, from the life that I've lived, from the education that I have. I mean, you read the Bible and it's like 66 books, 40 different authors, I've written over two and a half thousand years. It's not actually one book, but it's actually 66 books. And when you read in there and you're seeing dead people raised and blind, seeing and lame walking, and you think, oh, what a load of salt. What a load of crap, fish, chips and salt. You get it for fish, the swear word, chip salt, what a load of salt. Um, and I kept looking at it and I'm reading this thing and I'm thinking, nah. And then you see the plagues and all these people getting bashed and, and put to death and... God telling them off and they turn back to him and you're thinking, wow, this bloke, if he's a God, he's a pretty mean looking God. And you think, it's truth. You mean, and so if he's a God of love, how can he do all that sort of stuff? And there's so much to understand in that book. And I've been a Christian now 20, 23 years. And what I thought I knew, I didn't know. And I spent a lot of time trying to understand God. And it wasn't until I changed from trying to understand God to getting to know God that my, my walk just went... Phew. Don't try to understand God. He's too big to understand. But he's easy to know. 
And so now I just get up every day trying to learn to know God. Um, but my walk is my walk. It's none of your business. Your walk is your work. It's none of my business. Um, we are a faith-based rehabilitation centre, unashamedly. We are a Christian rehabilitation centre. We don't rehabilitate Christians, even though every single one of them need it. And me included, even today, I still need it. But we are unashamedly a faith-based rehab. We are a Christian rehab. We believe that God is God and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that we're saved by faith, not by works. And to unpack that, I will in a second. Now, I want to put the message straight. There's a lot of people in Shalom and you're not a Christian and that's okay. You can be in Shalom for three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years, three years. And if you don't become a Christian, that's okay. But this is my house and we're going to go to church and we're going to read the Bible. And, and, and so if you want to stay in my house, you're going to come to church with us and you're going to read the Bible. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and if you don't like it here, there are rehabs all over Perth and Australia that are all doing their best. Um, and they don't do it how we do it. We don't do it how they do it. Um, if it doesn't work for you, then just find another rehab if you don't like it. Um, but this is how we're doing it here. You don't have to become a Christian. Um, I say to people, sin isn't sin until you're conscious of sin. In other words, wrongdoing isn't wrongdoing until you're conscious of wrongdoing. If... if I keep touching this water bottle, touch this water bottle, and then one day somebody in authority says, Peter, don't touch that water bottle. And then I touch the water bottle after I've been told not to touch it, and then it's wrongdoing, but up until then it wasn't wrongdoing. You get it? Yeah. Um, and so I don't care if you're, um, I say this every week, I don't care if you're homosexual. I don't care if you're a lesbian. I don't care if you're cross-dressing and do all these different stuff. I don't care if the LGBTs all that. Um, but there's just no relationships here. You can come in gay, you can leave gay. You can come in lesbian, you can leave lesbian. But there's just no relationships here. Um, and what's the difference between lying and homosexuality? Nothing. What's the difference between swearing and stealing? Nothing. It's just, who are we to categorise things? I mean, don't point out people's other stuff and don't elevate one sin or one life-controlling issue when they're all exactly the same. Um, but again... In your heart, you will know in your heart what is right and what is wrong. You will know in your heart. From the day we're born until the day we die, and we are being programmed, and we're programmed by the way our parents are our parents, and the way they model motherhood and fatherhood in the home, um, the way they speak behind closed doors and in public, and the way that body language, the way they treat each other. We learn their behaviours and we learn to be as they are. You're programmed by the schools you go to, um, the way the teacher teaches, the kids that you hang around. And in life, all of us, we all face circumstances that we do and we don't create. And when we face those circumstances, we have to make a choice how to handle it. Um, a lot of us will face circumstances that we do and we don't create. But at the end of the day, we are the ones that make the choice that determine not only the direction of our life, but the consequence of our choice. Every decision that you make will have a consequence. It's always easy to blame somebody else for why you are like you are. Like I did, I blamed my mum and I blamed my dad my whole life um, for why I was like I was. And I used what I went through to justify me making decisions that I knew that I shouldn't have made. Um, they don't love me. They've done this. They've done that. So I'd stick a pick mum, smoke a pipe, pop a pill. And I had no idea that I was living a life full of anger and bitterness, resentment, frustration and... and, and and, but I was where I was because of my decisions. Um, the Bible is not just a book. It is 66 books. Uh, not one book. And it's written over two and a half thousand years. It's written by 40 different authors. Um, when you read the Bible, I don't read much, but I, I only read the Bible. But when you start reading the Bible, it's made up of two sections. And you've got the Old Testament, which is from Genesis through to Malachi. And then you've got the New Testament, which is from Matthew uh, through to Revelation. And what separates the two um, was Christ. So the Old Testament, all those books, I think there was about 36 of them, uh, were written before Christ was born, over 1,500 years to 2,000 years. And, and one day somebody, 300 years after Christ died, brought them all together. The first five books is known as the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And the rest of them are written by prophets and, 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 and other people who come behind. But when you read the Old Testament, you can see the New Testament in there, even though it hasn't unfolded 
or even though it wasn't written. Those books were written before Christ was born. And you read that, you see in Isaiah, it says, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He was pierced for our transgressions, that the sin and the iniquity of the whole world was upon him. Well, who's that? That's Christ. But Christ wasn't even born yet. Uh, but God had a plan to restore all humanity back to himself. And, and he talked about it in the Old Testament. And then you, you see Christ, um, Christ comes, and then you see the New Testament. And when you say, read the New Testament, you think, hang on a sec, I read that before, and that was in the Old Testament. Who could bring 66 books together over two and a half thousand years and package it like that? Yeah. Unless you become like a child, you'll never learn. You need to be teachable. You try to understand things with your limited upbringing, as me. I tried to understand God, not trying to get to know God. And, but as I read the Old Testament, wow, that's... And then I read the New Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Um, it's not just one book, it is 66 books. There's a lot of stuff that you're going to read in there that you find hard to swallow. But you don't let one page or one chapter or one story turn you off the whole story. Um, you'll see in the Bible that um, there was a lot of people and they were doing stuff that they shouldn't do and well, God would discipline them and then they would get to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and they would cry, God, if you're real, we need your help. Who here is sitting in here, you hit the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and you prayed that one prayer, God, if you're real, I need your help. Every one of you in here, and that's what it is in the Old Testament. They were doing stuff that they shouldn't have done. They hit the brick wall and they chucked that prayer up, God, if you're real, I need your help. And then he would come in and then he would send prophets and priests and kings and, 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 and then he'd just bless them and give them all this abundance of stuff and no one like, uh, would have any problems. And then all of a sudden, they'd forget what he'd done in the next generation. And we, the third generation didn't teach the next generation. And they went back to how they were again. And then they hit the brick wall. And then they said, God, if you're real. And so it shows how he, he fixed them. And then they disobeyed. They hit the brick wall. He called out. They fixed them. And, it, and that's the whole of the Old Testament when you read the stories. It's a love letter. God just doesn't want us to be bad people. He just wants us to be good people. Uh, and you see that in there. Um, it's also not just um, we can learn from history about those who have come before us. The, the Bible is actually a, a love letter to humanity. Um, it actually teaches us how to live the life that God has called us to live. And whether you're a Christian, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Buddhist Muslim, or whether you've got no faith or whatever you are, um, it says that the wisdom of God is in the heart of a man and a woman and that a person of understanding draws it out. That I am the great shepherd of the sheep and my sheep know me, they hear my voice. Um, God's voice is in the heart of every single person on the face of this planet. Every single person. Every one of you, you say you don't hear God's voice, well, that's a lie. And I'll call it for what it is, it's a lie. Every person, whether you believe or you don't believe, you hear God's voice. There's only two voices. There's a light and there's a dark. There's a good, there's a bad. There's a God, there's a devil. You can call it the light, you can call it the higher power, you can call it, well, I think something's up there. But the light, God, the higher power, whatever you want to call him, he is 100% flawlessly, beautiful, perfectly, everything that is good, uncontaminated. Truth in its purest form, honesty in its purest form, integrity, the fullness of love. You couldn't, love would never give up on anybody. He is 100% love, 100% faithful, 100% Everything that is mind-blowingly off the charts good. And the dark, the devil, the demon, the bad man, or whatever you want to call him, he is opposite. He is 100% everything that is bad. He is unforgiveness, will never forgive. Hatred, gossip, envy, greed, I mean, pain, sickness. He divides, he destroys, he contaminates, he's cancer. He wants to separate mums and dads, brothers and sisters, children. He wants you to have death and he wants you to have life, light and dark. They sit on your shoulder and they will be on your shoulder till the day you die. I never realised that that was God's voice and that was the devil's voice or that was the light's voice or that was the dark's voice. I always listened to the dark because I liked the dark. I liked the rush as I stuck the pick in my arm. I like the sleeping around. I like the 16 days no sleep. I like the wads of cash every time I pull out a drawer. There's 30 grand here and 40 grand. I like the guns. I like the lifestyle. I like the people because that's what I grew up with. But in my heart growing up, I knew that there was more. That I knew in my heart that what I was doing was not normal. 
I knew it, but I didn't know how to get over there to the light. I just had no idea. And it's sad that we have to hit the bottom of the bottom of the bottom to get to the top. Why do we need God? Why do we need God? I mean, all he does is put boundaries in our life. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't swear, don't sleep around, don't lie, don't gossip, don't steal. Ah, you know, fun, mate. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like, sometimes you can be a pain in the pickle. But he's right. Um, but I don't like that he's right because I've always done this. But I have a choice. Do I do this or do I do this? If I do this, I get hurt. My wife gets hurt. My children get hurt. My family get hurt. My body gets hurt. My life gets hurt. And, and you can keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But there's a consequence. And you will suffer the consequence. Um, if you learn to listen to him, there's a consequence. And you will suffer the consequence. You have a choice to suffer the consequence of death or you have a choice to suffer the consequences of life. One voice says, pick the rubbish up off the ground. The other voice says, stuff it. I didn't put it there. This voice says, take the shopping trolley back. This one says, stuff it. They get paid for that. This one says, don't stick that pick in your arm. This one says, oh, mate, it's good rush. Everyone else is doing it. This one says, don't smoke. This one says, oh, come on, mate. You need it. It's like, oh, my brain, you get up from the second you wake to the second you sleep, and it's like, and at the end of the day, oh, my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just does your head in. I don't want to think what I think, but I think what I think, and I don't want to think what I think, but I keep thinking it anyway. I don't want to do what I do, but I do what I do, and I don't want to do it, but I do it anyway. Who would deliver me from this body of death and decay? Everything this world offers, why do we need God? We've got a nice house, nice car, money in the bank. I mean, we don't even give him time. Um, the message that Christianity has to proclaim, if the message that Christianity has to proclaim is actually true, how do we communicate what we know is true without pushing what we believe down people's throats? I look at my 26 years in prisons and institutions and all the, the life that I live, and I had a lot of people coming across my path telling me about God. Um, some would say, Jesus! Jesus! Oh, my God. Right turn, class. <laughs> Some was hitting the Hay Street Mall and on the speaker and they're going, the gospel, the gospel. And, and, and it was just like, and they hand me the pamphlet and I walk away and, oh God, I can't put the pamphlet in the bin. So I'd find a stranger to give the pamphlet to. <laughs> you know, Some would go, hallelujah, brother, praise the Lord, glory to God. And I'm thinking, man, are you for real? People really talk like that? And it's like, from where I'm come from, man, it's like too hot for me, bro. And I'd run. Um, but I remember the encounter that I had with God. It was a really profound encounter where the ground moved, a voice in heaven. I heard a voice saying, and be still and know that I'm God. I had tears running down my face. I, I felt his presence washing over me. And, and as, as the months and the years started to follow, he changed my life. God changed my life. He changed my wife. He changed my children. And when you've come from the life that I've come from, pay attention, please. When you've come from the life that I've come from, and everything that you ever dreamed of it starts to come true, they, I started to change. My wife changed. My children changed. Everyone around me could see I was changing. I started to become a geek. You want to tell people, hey, them wacky Christians... What they're saying is true. And I become what they call a God botherer. He who is uh, uh, forgiven little, loves little. He who is forgiven much, loves much. Man, I didn't deserve to be forgiven. I didn't deserve to experience the changes that were taking place in my life. Supernaturally, to get up every day and just know that my life was changing and it was him that doing the changing, I'm just in awe, mate. And my family, my family are stuck in prisons. My, my family are the drug addicts. I mean, the thief, the weak and the null and despised things of this world. Most of my family are laying in a prison cell, rocking side to side, not, not wanting to be who they are and wanting to change their life. A lot of us don't want to be who we are. And when you experience the changes, 
I went out to Acacia Prison. I'm trying to tell everybody about, hey, God is real. And I become a God botherer. A lot of people that I grew up with um, said, Lyndon James, what are you doing here? And I said, I've got the keys, brother. Would pack out the chapel. <laughs> Five years, I'm seeing blokes coming in and out, in and out. But my whole 26 years in prisons institutions, they were coming in, out, in, out, in, out. And then I go to jail as a chaplain for five years, watching me come in, out, in, out. You know what I mean? And then from 2010 to 2012, floating around the streets, taking him to all these different rehabs and other places to get help. It wasn't changing their lives like mine had changed. We were taking them from an illegal drug to a legal drug. We weren't fixing the root cause of the problem. And the root cause of the problem is in here. 95 plus percent of you in here, the root cause of why you are like you are is childhood trauma. Whether it's the separation of mum or dad, whether you were molested, whether you were abused, whether you were bashed, um, whether you moved around to 16 different schools. I mean, something happened to you as a child, which is what initiated you going off track. How do we communicate what we know to be true without pushing religion down someone's throat? Now, since running Shalom in the last 13 years, it's not by proselytising. Some people are new, some people are mature Christians. Me, I try to become all things to all men and all women that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. Each one of us are called to run our race. In other words, work out our own salvation I and mean, be the best us we can be. And don't try to be me, don't try to be you, don't try to be a uh, holier than thou person, don't try to fit in with the Christianese people or the proselytizers. You be who God has called you to be. And how you do that is just getting to know him. Not trying to understand him, but getting to know him. As you, as you start to get to know him, you will understand him. The wisdom of God and the counsel of God, the instruction of God, is in the heart of every man and every woman and that a person of understanding draws it out. I am the great shepherd of the sheep, he says. My sheep know me, they hear my voice. Learn to listen, to do what's right. Here's the voice that says, pick the rubbish up off the ground. If you walk past and you see it on the ground, you'll hear a voice. Who's had that voice? Pick the rubbish off the ground. Not everybody in here. And if you keep walking, well, if you're not going to listen, he's not going to speak. It's like when you have your beers, you'll have one beer, Two beers, and you get this voice like you're having too many. And they oh, no, that's all right. And they say a couple more. Next day you get up and say, oh, I'm not going to drink today. And, then, and don't drink, don't drink. Oh, and then by lunchtime, oh, go on, you worked hard all day. And then you have a beer and then, you just, and then he just stops talking and just lets you go again. Until you hit the brick wall and then he starts again. And he, when he gets your attention, he'll speak. But he's trying to warn you. Um, and the more you learn to listen, the more you get to know him. The more you turn to learn to get to obey him, the, the louder his voice gets. When you walk past that piece of pipe, rubber, pick it up. And if there's two, pick it up. If there's ten, pick it up. Do you want to be part of the solution, light, or do you want to be part of the problem, dark? That's his voice. He's the one that says, don't steal. He's the one that says, buy that person a coffee. He's the one that says, you need to go say you're sorry. No, nah, but they done this to me. But he says, no, you say sorry. Having unforgiveness isn't, where, isn't the problem of the person who caused the unforgiveness, it's with the person who takes unforgiveness. If you have unforgiveness towards a person, you brought judgment upon them, and upon your own life, but you brought judgment upon them, but you, you've done this to me. And you walk around, it's like a cancer that festers in the inside. It doesn't affect, that, forget, uh, affect them, it affects you. But by going and asking their forgiveness, for having unforgiveness towards them, it sets you free, you can feel it lift. Holding on to unforgiveness is like swallowing rat poison and expecting the other person to die. Now, how do we communicate what we know to be true without pushing religion down someone's throat? It's in how we live our life. Oh, but I thought you were a Christian. Yeah, well, Christians all make mistakes. Every single one of us. And we do what we don't want to do. It just means we have a faith in a higher power and that we are all in rehab. Christianity should be called rehabilitation. It should be, because it's transforming us from how we used to be to how we should be. If you think we should be liars and thieves and adulterers and drug dealers, and then go play in the dark. You don't belong here. But if you think you should be a good dad, a good husband, 
He should be a man of integrity and honesty and kindness and patience and forgiving and faithful and loving. And that's the God that we serve. He is the source of everything that is 100% good and he is the source of everything that's 100% bad. Now, the Bible's 66 books. Um, it's not just a love letter to humanity. It's not just an instruction manual for us to live the life that God has called us to live. But there's a big message in there. Now, when God created the whole world, he created everything flawlessly good. Everything was perfect. There was no sickness, no disease. Everything was created perfectly good. He separated the light from the dark and he put a barrier there. That's a that little barrier there. Dark light on top, dark on the bottom. I mean, and he, and he made it. Everything was perfect. He used to walk on the earth, mix amongst it. You picture the light. The closer and closer you come to the light, the more the darkness has to flee. Would you agree? Yes. The closer and closer you bring the light to the dark, the darkness has to go. You cannot extinguish the light. The light is stronger. Now, if you picture God being 100% flawless, 100% beautiful, 100% loving, 100% forgiving, he should, he's 100% everything that we as human beings should aspire to be. And then the world would have no problems. No one had any problems. Um, but when he created everything, he created everything flawlessly good. He separated the dark and he separated the lights. And then on the sixth day he rested and he put man and woman, Adam and Eve, in the garden. Now, if God says, do not touch his water bottle and you touch it, well, that's disobedience. Would you agree? Yes. So God created everything and he put Adam and Eve in the garden and he said to you, hey, look at that. Look at all these fruit and veggies and all these animals and all that. Do whatever you want. Pick out. Help yourself. Have a good feed. But do not touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't do it. Because the second you do, you will surely die. Die is not talking about a physical death. He's talking about a spiritual death. In other words, my presence in you will have to leave you because I can't abide in disobedience. I can't be in this sin. He can't be 99.9999999. He's 100%. He can't be in the presence of anything other than himself. Otherwise, he wouldn't be 100%. He has to be, and he always will be, uncontaminated, flawless, beyond our limited comprehension. Um, and the dark is the opposite to what he is. And he said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because the second you do, you will surely die. I will have to separate myself from you. And so what happens? They end up biting the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And all of a sudden, it was like these scales fell from their eyes. They were opened. They realised they were naked. They touched the bottom. Oh no, what have I done? And they closed themselves. And they were scared because they knew that they'd done something wrong. When they'd done that, they let sin in the world. There's a gap there. They let it come in. God's gone, oh no! What have you done? What have you done? My God is my dad. My God is my father. He is faithful. He loves me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He created me in his image. He has begun a good work in me and he will carry that work on until that day that Jesus returns. He has changed my life. He does what he does, not because of me, but in spite of me. And I get up each day to see what it is that he does. But if I know my God is a good God... I reckon the second I bit that apple, he cried. What have you done, my children? God doesn't want to be separated from us. He created us in his image. He doesn't want a bunch of robots. He gives us free rule to make a right choice or a, bad, a wrong choice. You are where you are because of the decisions that you make. God was in us, empowering us to live the life that he called us to live. And he gave us free will. We took a bite of the apple and then sin entered the world. When sin entered the world, they took the keys to life and death. God had to separate himself. So, oh my God, what have we done? And when you read the Bible, it tells you how God had a plan from Genesis right through um, to Malachi, how God had a plan. 
Because somebody's got to pay that price for sin. The penalty of sin is death. It's spiritual death. Not physical death, spiritual death. Now God loves every person on the face of the planet, regardless of their race, regardless of their religion, regardless of their sin. God loves us. He knows that we're going to stuff up and he knows that we're going to make mistakes because we have a sinful nature. We do what we don't want to do. We do what we know that we shouldn't do. We don't mean to do it, but we do it anyway. But God knew. And when you read and, and from Genesis through to Malachi, you see how he had a plan to restore all of humanity back to himself. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He was pierced for our transgressions. The sin and the iniquity of the whole world was upon him. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, otherwise you will surely die. The penalty of sin is death. Now if God says do not eat of that water bottle, if you eat of the water bottle, the penalty of sin is death. Now one, if God says do not do it and you do it, is that sin? Yes. I can't hear. Yes. Okay, and if God says the penalty for that is death, if God doesn't carry out uh, that penalty, is he God? No. If God says this is what's going to happen and he doesn't follow through with it, he's a liar. He's not 100%. And so God has to follow through with what it is that he says, otherwise he wouldn't be what he is. He doesn't want any of us to sin. And so it says that he had a plan to restore all of humanity back to himself. Somebody, somebody's got to go in there and get that key. Well, I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump myself on the cross and I'll, and I'll die. And, and I, God, take me. Um, I'll die it for all of you. And I mean that, Lord God, today, if you can save every person here, then chuck me in the pit of hell. That's what the Apostle Paul cried. He wished he could die, that all of you could live, but it's not. It's an individual choice. Now, you picture being a Christian man knowing this story is true, and people don't know what I know. And all of us, we try to communicate what we know to be true, and the best way that we know how, and it's like, but sometimes it's just not the way we should be doing it. Um, me, I try to become all things to all men, in other words, you, and make you where you're at, but if they were Christianese people, I'd speak differently, because they know a bit more. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so the penalty of sin is death. I'll pay the price to sin. Well, hang on, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I mean, I deserve it anyway. Somebody, somebody go and find me somebody we can stick on that cross. That, that would be good enough to pay the price of sin. Can anyone think of anyone? No. And Jesus, when he was born, uh, he said, it says in the Bible he'd be conceived of a virgin. Jesus Christ was born. He lived 33 years on this earth. He never stole, he never lied, he never cheated. He never sinned at all in any way, shape or form. God was in Christ reconciling all of humanity back to himself. God was in Jesus Christ, empowering him to live the life that he called him to live. 33 years on the earth, never lied, never done nothing at all in any way, shape or form. Started his ministry at the age of 30. Raised up 12 buffets for apostles. All of them from different personalities and different backgrounds and the weak and the null and despised things of this world. He chose those who rather wouldn't normally get chosen. He spent three years with them. And when they got him and they nailed him to the cross and all that sort of stuff, and he's up on the cross, I mean, he says, Father, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They were spitting at him, they were whipping him, they were flogging him, they were making fun of him, taking the piss out of him. And, he, and all he could do was look upon him and he says, look, all of you here, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, forgive them, Father. They don't mean to stick a pick in their arm. They don't mean to sleep behind their wives' back. They don't mean to be a bad dad. They don't mean to lie and steal. They don't mean it. And he, he knows us. Christ knows us. You mean I do what I don't want to do. I don't want to do it, but I keep doing it. Just, it pisses me off. And he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then in and, and, and the very next verse, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After he said, Father, forgive them for they know what, the, what they're doing, 
God took his presence off his son. He stood back. And there's the perfect sacrificial lamb of God who had never sinned at all in any way, shape or form. And God put all the sin of all humanity on his son. All your sin, all my sin. Sins of the past, sins of the future, sins of today, sins of tomorrow, sins of yesterday, all on Jesus. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he died and breathed his last. He goes down into the darkness. Can darkness hold a saint? Can a darkness hold any person that has never sinned? So he goes down and he says, three days in the tomb. He paid the price for all of humanity's sin. He experienced the death that we deserve. He took back the key to life and death. He comes down like a Trojan horse from heaven. He goes into hell. All of hell saying, yeah, we got the bugger. And then he gets down and he gets on the throne and he pops out the bottom of the horse and steps out and says, hey, Satan. No, he says. <laughs> and he just grabbed the keys to life and death. The Bible said that he descended and then he ascended back into heaven and led captives in his train. Christ Jesus holds the key to life and death. He paid the price for our sin so that we wouldn't have to. You are not just a fart in the wind. When you die, when you die, there is a heaven and there is a hell. You are like a caterpillar that one way will turn into a butterfly. You will pop out of that cocoon. Death is a door that every one of us will go through. Some like a cancer victim with a straw stuck up their butt. Some will go splat. Some will be dying in their sleep. Some will get cut in half, some will get chopped, some will get shot. But we're all going to croak it. When you die, where do you want to spend eternity? Jesus Christ, he is the way, he is the truth and he is the life. You are saved by faith and faith alone. God says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whomsoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He says to you, to me, to everyone watching, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. If you confess that you are a sinner, if you confess that you make mistakes and you do stuff that you know that I don't want you to do and say you're sorry, and if you believe that I would love you enough that I would send my son to die in your place for your sin, I will forgive you. I will forgive all of your sin. Sins of your past, sins of your present, and sins of your future. I will cleanse you of all your sin and remove your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I will remember it no more. That's what happened to me when I cried out to God. God, I need you. I don't want to live this life anymore. And these veils drop from my eyes. His presence coming to my heart. Oh my God, he's real. Listen to his voice. You do not have to become a Christian here. But learn to listen to his voice. Call it your conscience, call it whatever you want, but the more you start to learn to listen and obey is the key. The more you start to learn to listen and obey, the louder the voice gets. And it gets to the stage one day where it's just, it's hard to throw a piece of rubbish on the ground. It's hard to swear. It's hard to do what you know you shouldn't. But you've ignored him for years and years. When you let him in, when you let him in, you will never, ever, ever be the same again. When you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and that he removes your sin as far as the east is from the west. And in the, in the New Testament, is an instruction manual for us to live the life that he's called us to live. In Matthew, it says, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Take one day at a time because each day has enough trouble of its own. You were given today as a gift. He knows that you're fallen. He knows that you're broken. We're, we're in New Testament times where the Spirit of God lives in us.
God doesn't ask us to do anything that we couldn't handle. His presence is in us, empowering us, strengthening us to live the life that he has called us to live. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only present in prophets, priests and kings, those who are anointed and appointed by God for a specific task or purpose. Today is in the hearts of every believer. If you love me, you will obey me, he says. No temptation has seized you or come upon you except that which is common to man. And that God would never ask you to do more than you can handle. What he's asking from you is different than what he's asking from you is different than what he's asking from you. He is the potter, you are not the potter. Shall the clay say to the potter, Lord, Lord, why do you make me this way? No, Lord, you mend me, you break me, you bold me. As long as there's blood in your veins and air in your lungs, God will continue to try and knock on your door. He will try and continue to knock on your door. And it's sad that you have to hit the brick wall, hit the end of your soul, and you cry out that prayer. He needs a broken vessel, someone who knows that they need help. You're in a really good place. You could be dead and in hell. But by the grace of God, you're alive. By the grace of God, you still have choices to make. You still have a life to live. Do you want to live it how you used to live it? Or do you want to live it how he wants you to live it? He won't violate your free will. We're not religious here. We are a Christian. People call us a cult. Yeah, well, I, I do follow the way which they call a cult. I believe that God is God and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that I am saved by faith and not by works. I know every day that I'm going to sin. I don't want to do what I do, but I do it anyway. I need Jesus. I need him today. I need him tomorrow. I don't want to be religious. I want to live my faith. People should see my faith in me by how I live my life, that my actions would speak louder than my words. The message that we carry as Christians, the world needs to hear. And the way that they will hear it is by how you live your life. You will make mistakes and that's okay. Don't point out the sin in other people's lives when you have a log in your own. Don't point out the splinter in somebody else's when you have a log in your own. The Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Your own salvation, not somebody else's. Why bring judgment and criticism on people around you? You work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Run your race with purpose in every step that you may win the prize. For many are called, but few are chosen. Wide is the pathway that leads to destruction and very narrow is the path that leads to life and there's very few who find it. Christianity isn't about religion, it's about a relationship with a living God that loves us. He wants us to tell the truth. He wants us to be good mums and dads. He wants us to forgive as we've been forgiven. He wants us to be 100% honest. He wants us to be the best us we can be. Tune in. It's like his voice, 98.1. Can't hear the station. 98.3, still can't hear the station. 98.4, and a bit of static. Ah, 98.5. Cross from death to life. I don't want to be in the dark. I don't want to be in the dark. You think about your children. Your children need to know what it is that we know. Your mum, your dad, your, your mean, no eye has seen, the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. No mind can conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. For those who have been called according to his purpose. For those he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. He's changing us into the image of Jesus. He's changing me into the image of Jesus. Work with him, not against him. Make it easy for him, not hard. He fixes everything. He chooses the weak and the null and despised things of this world to nullify that which is. He doesn't call the qualified, he calls the unqualified, and he qualifies them. <laughs> he's the duck's nuts, he's the bee's knees, bro. Why well, wouldn't you want to get to know him? So don't try to understand God. Unless you become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Get to know him, not to understand him. And as you get to know him, you will automatically come to know him. Be teachable. When you read it, yeah, okay, I don't fully agree with that, but let's keep wandering on. It's your own faith journey. Everyone got that? 